ahead and invoke the presence of the Holy Spirit as we get back started and ask the Holy Spirit to please guide our reflections so that we can get through these next gospel texts in a sufficient way so that we can go home uh, with something to meditate on in our prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We simply repeat after me, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. And let's make some acts of faith, hope, and charity. I believe in you, Jesus. I trust in you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so we pick up with uh, the Midnight Mass coming from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. And here's what we read. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. This was the first enrollment when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be enrolled, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to be delivered. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in that region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good news, or good tidings, as some translations say, of a great joy which will come to all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased." End quote. The first issue that we need to consider is the issue of the census and Quirinius's reign as governor. Okay? Uh, when I began my seminar in Ellensburg, there was a gentleman who asked me a question about St. Luke's account of Augustus Caesar's census and Quirinius' reign as governor in Syria, to which I did not have an answer. I would literally never encountered the question or come across the question, so consequently I didn't have an answer. And it was stated in the form of an objection, because we were talking about the Bible being free from all error even in historical and scientific matters, as taught by the Second Vatican Council, that Scripture is free from all error. All their parts are inspired by God and consequently have God as its author, therefore free from error. To which he responded and said, how can the Bible be free from all error when St. Luke makes an historical error right here? And here's how the objection goes. St. Luke ascribes the census involving Judea to be put forth by Caesar Augustus at the time of Jesus' birth, circa 6 to 4 BC. Now, just to let you know, 6 to 4 BC, Jesus' birth, that's a legitimate scholarly understanding of Jesus' birth because from what I understand, the calendar by which we follow now, which was given to us by a particular saint, but I don't remember his name. Father, do you remember? Maybe not. I don't remember the saint's name, but the saint gave us the system of our calendar of how we look at it today. And from what the scholars have discovered, he was about six years off. You're right? So it puts Jesus' birth, if we look at it from our perspective of our calendar, to 6 BC. And the reason why is because he missed it on how the ancients would have kept time and their calendar from a certain historical Roman event. I can't remember the details, so I apologize for that, but the article I read is slipping my mind right now. But just know that that's a legitimate position within the church, that Jesus' birth was about 6 B.C. All right, so the objection says, okay, Luke puts this census by Caesar Augustus involving Judea at the time of Jesus' birth, about 6 B.C. And he mentions, notice he mentions Quirinius, right? Governor of Syria. So, St. Luke talks about a census mandated by Caesar Augustus. Quirinius as governor of Syria. Jesus' birth, 6 B.C. But we know historically 
that Quirinius was not governor of Syria until 6 AD. There was a census mandated by Caesar Augustus in 6 AD that involved Judea because Judea in 6 AD was officially incorporated into the Roman Empire. You follow that line? So let me just kind of go over it again. Okay, Historical facts, this is what we know. 6 AD, you have a census mandated by Caesar Augustus. It's involving Judea because that's when Judea is being officially incorporated into the Roman Empire, right? If it's not in the Roman Empire, why would they need to be taxed? Why would they be part of the Roman census? Get it? Quirinius is governor of Syria, 6 AD. But St. Luke talks about a census mandated by Caesar Augustus involving Judea. Quirinius is governor of Syria in 6 BC. See the discrepancy? It seems as if Luke is making an historical or a historical mistake here. And when I was asked this question, I was like, I don't know. <laughs> so I simply went and emailed my mentor and said, what's the answer? <laughs> and so I'm going to share with you what he gave. And I actually found it. I actually had an old ancient commentary. I think it's actually just republished. It's called um, A Catholic Commentary on Sacred Scripture. And it's an ancient commentary that uh, many scholars, faithful Catholic biblical scholars use. And he actually gives a, a synthesis of this issue. And so here's how we respond to the objection. First of all, let's focus on the census, okay? It seems as if Luke is, a, is asserting the census mandated by Caesar Augustus in 6 BC when we know historically the census of Caesar Augustus was in 6 AD. So let's deal with the census. Here's the answer. According to historical evidence, there were two censuses. Is that a word? That doesn't sound right. Yeah. Is censuses a word? Okay. When I was typing, I was like, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Last night when I was giving the teaching at Holy Apostles, I was like, census, censuses, doesn't sound right. So anyway, <laughs> here's the first one. The first census was mandated by Caesar Augustus in 12 BC, but it was a worldwide general census that involved the whole of the Roman Empire. And because it was such a big census, the census would carry over several years. All the way into up until the time of six, around 6 BC, which is Jesus' birth. Which is where St. Luke is ascribing the census of Caesar Augustus. So the first census, there, and we know this according to historical evidence, uh, for example, two Roman historians, Tacitus and Suetonius, record that Augustus left a written record of the financial reform he instituted specific to abuses with regard to taxation in the provinces around the world. So we have historical evidence that Caesar Augustus mandated a worldwide census because of certain abuses and taxation that were taking place with taxation. Now, somebody might say, well, Carlo, why would Judea be involved in that first census in 12 to 6 BC when Judea wasn't even an official part of the Roman Empire until 6 AD? Follow the question? It's a good question. Here's the answer. Who was the king of Judea? Herod. Was he a rightful king, the line of David? No. He was a puppet of the Roman Empire. Whose authority did King Herod have over Judea? Rome's authority. And so consequently, although they would not have been officially incorporated into the Roman Empire yet, they still would have had to pay taxes. Rome still would have had made them pay taxes and thus be a part of the census that Augustus Caesar mandated in 12 BC carrying over into 6 BC. Which would be the time when Judea would be subjected and involved in the census. So, the first census was the general worldwide census before and at the time of Jesus' birth. And Luke gives us a couple of clues. First, he writes the first enrollment. Notice as if that implies there was a second one sometime later. And this fits perfectly with the historical record that the first enrollment involved the worldwide census. And Luke records that, the first enrollment. Secondly, notice what St. Luke writes. It was the whole world. A census of the whole world. 
So it's the first enrollment of the whole world, fits perfectly with the historical record that says there was a first census by Caesar Augustus that was a worldwide census. Now, this is significant. To understand the first census being a general worldwide census because the second census that took place in 6 AD was a directed exclusive census only for Syria and Judea. Wasn't a worldwide census. It only involved Syria and Judea. And it, it was then that Judea was officially incorporated into the Roman Empire. So the first was worldwide, the second was not. St. Luke tells us that the first enrollment that he's ascribing at the time of Jesus' birth is worldwide. So which one is Luke record, recording? The first one. This one in 6 AD is actually referred to in Acts chapter 5, verse 37. In Acts chapter 5, verse 37, that is the census that's referred to in the book of Acts. So you might want to cross-reference that. You can check that out. But notice what's happening here. There is a confusion about the censuses. Amen? People are mixing up the census of 6 AD and the census of 12 BC that would carry over to 6 BC. Yeah. That's the next question. You know, it's, it's so funny because last night somebody asked the same question at the same particular point in the, in the discussion uh, in regard to Crenius. And that's the next question. We're going to get to it. And so we're just dealing with the censuses right here, okay? So there's a confusion. Now, you can go to Wikipedia and type in Crenius' name, right? And it'll say Crenius was governor of Syria, 6 AD. Judea, officially incorporated into the Roman Empire. St. Luke ascribes Quirinius being governor of Syria at the time of Jesus' birth, which is a historical error. And actually references, I think I remember, it references Raymond Brown. Now I haven't looked in the text itself to get first-hand knowledge of this, but I remember reading on the Wikipedia article, it references the scholar, the Catholic scholar, biblical scholar, Raymond Brown, who actually asserts Luke made a historical error here. And putting Quirinius as governor and the census at the time of Jesus' birth when we know it should have been in 6 AD, right? So it's out there. The objection is out there. The understanding that Luke made a mistake here historically is out there. But we can respond and say, nope, there were two general census. Now, in regard to the question about Quirinius, somebody says, but Corlo, Luke says Quirinius was governor of Syria at the time of Jesus' birth. How do we respond to that? Quirinius served two terms governing Syria. The first term was a co-governing ship. Governing, co-governor. With a man by the name of Sensius Saturninus in 9 to 6 BC. And you go on Wikipedia and you type in Sensius Saturninus, it'll show you that he was governor at that time from 9 to 6 BC. But according to the historical record, for example, Tacitus... Roman historian affirms that Quirinius, often translated as well as Cyrenius, so you might see the two there, but Quirinius, as we have it in our English version here, that Quirinius was a co-governor with Cincius in 9 to 6 BC. That he sort of reigned with Cincius over Syria at that particular juncture. And from what I remember reading is that I can't remember exactly where I found it. I was reading so many different things. But I remember reading that Cincius actually went off to, for battle, to fight a battle. And so Quirinius was put in his place as governor over Syria at that particular point in time. So, and then the second term where he becomes full governor of Syria would be in 6 AD when he was in charge of the census of Judea and Sir Syria when Judea was being incorporated into the Roman Empire. So he served two terms. And so that fits perfect with what St. Luke recounts. That there was a census mandated by Caesar Augustus that was worldwide. The first enrollment fits perfect with the historical record. Quirinius was governor of Syria. Fits perfect with the historical record that he served that first term with Cincius Saturninus, however you pronounce it, Saturninus, okay? So, that's how we can answer uh, this question, uh, or this, deal with this issue about the census and Quirinius' uh, governing ship. Now, I don't know how that applies to the Christmas story, <laughs> but just know this, that our religion is rooted 
in history. Notice how St. Luke, right off the bat, is calling to mind all of this historical stuff at this particular time in history with this particular governor, this particular Caesar. Why? Because, folks, our religion's not a mythology. It's not made up like the Greek myths, but it's rooted in history. And this is one of the claims that we have as Christians to the truth of Christianity. It's a historical religion. So, hopefully that helps. Now, the next theme or the concept that we find in this gospel text of Luke chapter 2 verses 1 through 14 is Jesus' Davidic kingship. And Luke gives us some obvious clues. Number one, in Luke chapter 2 verse 4, Luke tells that Jesus was of the lineage of David, right? So just as Matthew was emphasizing Jesus' Davidic kingship, Luke's doing the same thing here. An interesting clue is found in verses 7 and 12 where Luke tells us that Jesus was wrapped in swaddling cloths, all right? Now, from what I understand, that's just an ancient Jewish practice that they wrap their newborn babes in swaddling cloths. However, knowing the methodology of narration according to the ancient Hebrews, remember how in our session of a Catholic style of Bible study we said that the ancient authors dropped hints and clues in their narratives that actually make allusions to images in the salvation story. Right? Well, swaddling cloths or clothes, clothes is an image that calls to mind King Solomon. Because according to Wisdom chapter 7, verses 4 through 6, Solomon writes, I was nursed with care in swaddling cloths. For no king has had a different beginning of existence. There is for all mankind one entrance into life and a common departure, end quote. So swaddling cloths in the story of salvation in the biblical tradition is associated with King Solomon. And so here Luke is ascribing swaddling cloths using that image, emphasizing that detail two times in reference to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the new Solomon. Jesus understands himself to be the new Solomon. Remember later in his life he says, one, is greater than, one who is among you is greater than Solomon. Right? Referring to himself. So Jesus is the new Solomon the true son of David, the new Davidic king. Now, somebody might ask, well, what's the significance of this Davidic kingship? And once again, we already talked about this when I gave you the narratio of the Davidic kingdom falling apart, right? And all of the grief and sorrow, but yet there was a prophetical hope. The prophets, God rose up the prophets to give prophetical consolation that God would restore the kingdom with the son of David. And one example of this prophetical consolation of Israel for the restoration of the Davidic kingdom and the reunification of Israel comes from Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 24 through 28, which is what we referenced earlier. So here's the text. Here's what we read. My servant David... Now remember, that means the son of David, right? My servant David shall be king over them. They shall dwell in the land where your fathers dwelt that I gave to my servant Jacob. Notice, returning to the promised land. And David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. So you have God prophesying about son of David ruling over, governing his people once again in their promised land. Verse 26, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. Notice, the presence of God will be with his people once again. Why? Because the presence of God left his people. When Solomon's temple was destroyed in 587 BC, the glory of the Lord that would hover over Solomon's temple, cloud during the day, pillar of fire by night, remember that? That glory of the Lord left the temple prior to the destruction of the temple by the Babylonian Empire in 587 BC. So the prophets foretell of the messianic day when the glory of the Lord would return because there would be a new temple. And as we're going to see in a minute, we're going to find out what or who that new temple is. Verse 27, My dwelling place shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, when my sanctuary is in the midst of them forevermore. So notice the prophetical consolation of Israel consists of son of David reigning over Israel once again reunited and God dwelling in their midst and a new covenant of peace, an everlasting covenant forevermore. That's what the prophetical consolation of Israel and the restoration of the Davidic kingdom 
is. And so when Jesus, excuse me, when Luke ascribes to Jesus this Davidic image, telling us how Jesus is the son of David, etc., Luke is trying to emphasize that Jesus is the fulfillment of that prophetical hope. He is the son of David who's coming to reign over God's people, reunite them, and God is dwelling in their midst again. And who is that? Yahweh made flesh. Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father made flesh. God is in their midst. So the messianic hope is fulfilled in and through Jesus. Now, the next thing I want us to reflect upon is the significance of the good news. Recall how the angel appears to the shepherds in the field and says, Behold, I bring to you good tidings. We hear this in the Christmas season. Good tidings coming from sacred scripture or the good news. The Greek word here for the good news is ewangelion, from which we get, it means good news, and then we have in our English the gospel, right? When we, if I were to ask you, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm sure we could articulate that to some degree. He died on the cross, set us free from sin, so that we can go to heaven, be perfect and happy, amen. And that's good and true. That's right. However, when we can see the Evangelion or the gospel of Jesus in light of the historical background both of Rome and the Jewish people of Israel, and the Jewish people, we can see the depth of that statement, or feel the impact of that statement of saying the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or the angel coming to the shepherds and saying, I behold, I bring to you Evangelion. And he's talking to Jewish shepherds here, right? So what's the significance of this Evangelion? Everybody say that. Okay, so now when I say Evangelion, you know what I'm referring to, right? The gospel of Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the written documents. We call those gospels, why? Because they talk about the gospel of Jesus. So what's the significance of this? Well, first of all, Jesus is the true Caesar, i.e., he's the true Lord. In the Roman tradition, the Greek word Evangelion, its Latin equivalent is what? Evangelium. You see? The good news, the gospel, right? These terms in the Roman tradition would refer to Caesar's birth. That Caesar's birth was good news. And it would also be applied to his military victories. We actually have an ancient inscription from nine, dating to 9 BC, I think, where the word Evangelion is used in reference to announcing the birth of Caesar. You see? So, think about it, folks. In light of that historical background, you have the early Christians going around saying, the good news, the Evangelion, the Evangelium of Jesus. Them are fighting words, folks. <laughs> the early Christians, were they knew nothing of being politically correct in their statements. <laughs> And it, 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 yeah, and it's statements like this that would get their heads chopped off, which it did. And they were martyred for it because what they were saying was the Evangelion of Jesus supersedes the Evangelion of Caesar. It is the birth of Jesus that's more important than the birth of Caesar. It's the victory that Jesus brings that's more important than the victory of Caesar. And finally, Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. Why? Because you had the imperial cult. Caesar demanded worship. They believed he, he asserted divinity and ascribed divinity to himself. And so you see the political impact that this statement has in the early centuries of Christianity of the good news of Jesus. We kind of lose that now, but we see it when we look at it in light of the Roman tradition. However, there's a two-fold aspect here. Not only does it have impact for Rome and for the Roman audience... But it also has tremendous impact and meaning for the Jewish audience. And for the Jewish audience, this term, Evangelion, would signify that Jesus is the Messiah. How so? Well, all we got to do is go back to the prophetical tradition and ask the question, where is Evangelion used? If I want to know what the Evangelion of Jesus is, well, then I got to look back in the Jewish tradition and ask, is it found in the prophetical tradition of Israel? Is the Evangelion there? And the answer is yes. We find there are several texts, but I'm going to offer you two. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9 through 11. Here's we go. Isaiah says, Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Greek word there. Once again, the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. 
is Ewangelion. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of Ewangelion. Lift it up, fear not, say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Remember, God returning, the returning of God's presence. Verse 10, Behold the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. What does that signify? God's victory and salvation being brought to God's people. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Verse 11, He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will, what? Gather the lambs in his arms, signifying the reunification of those 12 tribes of Israel that were split apart. He will carry them in his bosom. Okay, yeah. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. So according to Isaiah 40, the Ewangelion is what? God returning and dwelling in the midst of his people. Salvation. Reunification. That's the Ewangelion in the prophetical hope of Israel. We look at another text, Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. Through three. See if this text sounds familiar to you as Christians. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring Ewangelion to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn, who gr to grant to those who mourn in Zion. End quote. Where do you where does where does where do you remember that text is found in the New Testament? Does anybody recall? Not quite. Who in the synagogue? In the synagogue and who quotes it? Jesus. And what does he do? After he reads it, he closes the scroll, sits down, which was the common form of rabbinical teaching in ancient Judaism. They didn't stand to teach. They would sit to teach and give the homily. Father, how about sitting down giving the homily? Only bishops? Oh, that's right. That's right. The bishop. <laughs> that's right. The bishop sits in the cathedral and then sometimes reads the, hom reads the homily. Amen. That's right. And so he would sit down and what does he say? Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What did they try to do? They tried to drive him off the cliff. But what did Luke tells us? He went through them. Went through the crowd. How did he do that? I don't know. We can think about that. He had like divine power, you know, porting the Red Sea, porting the people, you know, and walking through type of thing. He's the new Israel. So anyway, notice, Ewangelion and the prophet of Isaiah. One of the essential things that we find here is the um, notice to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, which calls to mind the Jewish tradition of the Jubilee year. Every 50th year, the Jews would be released of their debt Slaves would be freed and all of your ancestral land would be returned back to you. Why did God institute the Jubilee year? To remind them how in the Exodus event, God released them of their debt, set them free from slavery and gave back the ancestral land of Canaan back to them that God promised to Abraham. So every 50th year, they would re be required to do all of this to recall that. Isaiah prophesies of the day that will come when the Messiah will proclaim this year of jubilee, this year of favor. Why? Because God would truly release his people from their debt, the debt of sin. Set them free from the slavery of sin. Return them back to the ancestral land of heaven, which is our origin, our promised land. Amen? So, this is what the Ewangelion calls to mind. And then as we saw there in Isaiah 61, the day of vengeance, right? God's victory, salvation. So when we come to Jesus, did I mess up on the PowerPoint there? I was one behind. My apologies. So when we come to Jesus, Luke highlights the good news, explains to us how the angel comes to the shepherds of Israel and says, Behold, I bring to you Evangelion. Folks, for the shepherds of Israel, that would have caused a lot of joy. Amen? Because they had been longing and waiting for God to return and dwell in their midst. For salvation. For reunification. For the year of favor of the Lord. The new jubilee year. And this is what the angel Gabriel, or the angel is proclaiming. I think it was Gabriel. Was it Gabriel? Am I right on that? When the angel came and proclaimed to the shepherds of Israel, behold, good tidings. So, nameless, right? Okay, thank you. 
<laughs> and so now, now we know what the gospel means, amen? Now we have a deeper sense and an understanding and you see the continuity with salvation history in regard to the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is why the early Jewish people a lot of them, some of them didn't convert, but some of them did. This is why they, they got so excited, because it was the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right, now, another issue that arises here in Luke chapter 2 is the firstborn argument against Mary's perpetual virginity in Luke 2.17. This is one, another argument that's often used against the Catholic understanding that Mary was a perpetual virgin. And that is, you know, when Luke records that Mary brought forth her firstborn son. As if implying there was, what, a second born and a third born, etc. So how do we respond to this objection or this question of the first born? Well, the first way is by refutation absurdum. Refutation abs absurdum is to refute by showing the absurdity of such a statement. So the, the objector says, Jesus was first born, therefore, necessarily, there was a second born. So we can show that such a statement is absolutely absurd. Here's our first example. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 5 through 6 we read, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee, or again I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. And again when he brings the firstborn into the world. That text is referring to God the Father speaking about the son. And the son is called the firstborn. That is the firstborn of the father, right? Well, does that mean the Father had a second born in the Godhead? Does that mean there's four persons in the Trinity? Heresy. There's a heresy for you, Padre. <laughs> Obviously not, right? And so just because firstborn is used doesn't necessarily require or mean a second born. Another example in refutation absurdum comes from Exodus chapter 13, verse 2. Consecrate to me, God says, all the firstborn. Here's the understanding. Whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. End quote. Does that mean that we have to wait to a second born before we can consecrate the first one to the Lord? Obviously not. First born simply means the male child who first opens the womb. So, we see by refutation absurdum, just because firstborn is used does not necessarily mean there was a secondborn. So, what's the significance of firstborn in the Jewish tradition? Well, first of all, as we just referenced in Exodus 13.2, it signified consecration to the Lord. Uh, consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever is first opening the womb. So it signified consecration to the Lord. That's the, what the firstborn title signifies. And this is what Luke seems to be emphasizing because later in Luke chapter 2 verses 22 through 23, Luke writes this, and when the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to the Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. So notice that's the context of St. Luke referring to Jesus as the firstborn. So he says firstborn and immediately following later, a few verses later, he talks about the consecration of Jesus to the Lord in the temple. So this is the significance of the title firstborn. Calls to mind the consecration to the Lord. And then secondly, it signifies the rights of inheritance. The first male child to open the womb of the mother for the first male child, um, the firstborn would receive the inheritance of his father. And I have a picture up there of Isaac, right? Esau, Jacob, remember Esau had the rights of the inheritance, but actually forfeited over to Jacob. And Jacob tricks Isaac. Isaac gives the firstborn blessing. It was actually like an ordination. They would receive the rights of kingship. The rights of priesthood, the priesthood of the firstborn, the priesthood of the father within the home, within the house of the tribe. And then the, the material blessings of the land and the riches, etc. And so the firstborn was a title that signified the rights of inheritance. So if Jesus is called firstborn, what does that teach us about Christ? Well, Jesus has the rights of inheritance to the heavenly existence. The true promised land. The true land of his Father. And it is through Jesus 
through our faith and through participation in grace in Jesus Christ that we become what? Co-heirs, using the language of St. Paul, to that inheritance of heaven. That's the significance of Jesus being referred to as the firstborn in Hebrews chapter 1. So, that's how we respond to this until, uh, excuse me, firstborn argument. So, the fact that St. Luke calls Jesus the firstborn son of Mary, does that mean there was a secondborn? No, doesn't necessarily mean that. So that's how we can dispel that objection. And then finally, the last concept that arises out of this text of Luke chapter 2 is the Eucharistic symbolism. Where is the Eucharistic symbolism in this gospel narrative? First clue, Bethlehem. What does Bethlehem mean? House of bread. Interesting, huh? Here you have the bread of life that Jesus would call himself in John chapter 6 in the house of bread. See? And then the second clue being a manger. What is a manger? It's a food trough where animals feed from. So you have the bread of life in the house of bread being put in a food trough which symbolizes eating. And according to our native tongue in Louisiana, to eat in French, in Cajun, is manger. Let's manger, right? Allons manger, let's go eat. Something we're very familiar with saying back home. <laughs> we do a lot of eating. <laughs> so, so we see this sort of Eucharistic symbolism here. It's hints. Now, does it prove it? No. But it's hints of the Eucharist. House of bread, bread of life, in that house of bread, in a feeding trough. Amen? Okay. Now, we come finally... As I said, I'm going to skip the Mass at dawn, Luke 2, 15 through 20. Uh, the only thing there in Luke 2, 15 through 20 that I could, I, I mean, just, I know it's just my limited knowledge, but the only thing that stuck out for me is that it speaks of how Mary pondered these things in her heart. So you have the contemplation of Mary, something to meditate on. Um, so it just kind of completes Luke 2, 1 through 14. And so now we come to the Mass during the day of Christmas, which is John 1, 1 through 18, which is John's famous prologue. Now, because because I'm running short on time, I'm not going to read through the whole text with you guys. You can read it on your own, okay? So I'm going to skip through the PowerPoint here. But you can read verses 1 through 18. And the first major issue or concept that arises is the divinity of Jesus Christ. St. John begins, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. All right? Literally, we could spend a whole semester just unpacking this prologue of, of St. John. It's packed and loaded with meaning. So I'm just going to give you a few snippets here. What's the first clue that suggests the divinity of Jesus? Well, first, right off the bat, notice how John distinguishes Word, God. Word was with God as if they're two separate persons, right? They're distinct persons. But yet, he says, the Word was God. Okay? The Word was God. Sorry about the PowerPoint there. <laughs> so this is a clue that suggests that the Word was of the same nature as God. So in the first way he uses the term God is in reference to the person of the Father. And then in the second way he uses the term God is in reference to nature. And we do this in our Catholic theology. We say three persons, one God, right? What does that mean? Three persons possessing the one divine nature. We use that term God in reference to God nature, but we also use the term God in reference to the persons. God pray for me, God help me, God love me, God love you, etc. Referring to the, the person either of the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. So here we have John referring to the word was with God, that is the Father, personal usage there. But the word was God, referring to the divine nature. Now, an objection arises, and it goes as such. In the Greek text, the definite, or that is the Greek text of John 1, 1, the Word was God. In the Greek text of that phrase, the definite article, the, is not used before God. In other words, it doesn't say the Word was the God in the Greek text, because the is not used. So some will argue, consequently, it's not referring to the Word as the God, like Yahweh. And so we got to translate it as the Word was a God. Sound familiar to anybody? Jehovah Witnesses. Okay? Where did the Jehovah Witnesses get it from? Arius! 
in 325 AD in the 4th century. Arius was a priest who started the heresy of Arianism which said that Jesus was the perfect creation of the Father but not one of the same substance of the Father. Not one in nature but of like substance. A perfect creation of the Father. And he actually referred to John 1.1 1, 1 and said we can translate as the word was a God. Right? As if implying he's some sort of creature of God, as the angels are called gods in the Old Testament, right? Using that terminology in a very loose way. Now, this, this, is, this historical event is what brought about the Council of Nicaea at 325 AD when the bishops came together and they squashed the Arian heresy. And literally, as some of the early church fathers say, the whole church was Arian. Like, it was a big heresy that influenced many, many of the Catholic world. And so the bishops came together in 325 AD and declared that the word Jesus, the Son, was of the same substance of the Father. And what was the Greek word that they used? Father knows it. Homoousios. What was the other suggested word to use to describe the identity of the word? Homoousios. One iota. You ever heard of that phrase? One iota? That's where it comes from. Because one letter, the Greek letter iota, I, made the difference of the identity of Jesus. Homoi usios meant of like substance. And that's what the Arians were proposing. The bishops at Nicaea said, no, no. It's homo usios, of the same substance as the Father. The equivalent in Latin as Father has explained in Mass at time and time again, consubstantialum, which we come into the English in the new translation of the Creed as consubstantial. That's where it comes from. Council of Nicaea, dealing with the Arian heresy. This Arian heresy has resurfaced through the sect of the Jehovah's wit Jehovah Witnesses. And so they'll say, well, Corlo, definite article, the. It's not used with God. Therefore, we've got to say the word was a God. How do we respond? Here's the first way. Here's how we deal with this a-God argument. First of all, there are examples in Scripture where the definite article, the, is not used in reference to Yahweh. And there you have on the PowerPoint and in your handouts several examples where in the Greek text it doesn't say the God. It just says God. Does that mean we have to translate it as a-God and Yahweh is a-God? Obviously not. Another way of response. The definite article, now I'm not a Greek scholar, so I'm simply sharing with you second-hand knowledge here. The definite article, according to Greek 101, basic Greek, the definite article does not go with the predicate. It goes with the subject. And in the phrase, the word was God, word is the subject, God is the predicate. And so the definite article, the, goes with the subject, the word, but in basic Greek, it does not go with the predicate, God. And so according to basic Greek grammar, it, the definite article is not supposed to go there. Yes? One more thing that's helpful. In yes. In Greek, there is no indefinite article. There's no a or an. Okay, beautiful. And in Latin, there's neither article. Awesome, awesome. See, I didn't know that. Thank you, Father. And so, it would, and so in light of that, and knowing that, to, then we would have to ask the question to the Jehovah Witness, why in the world in your Bible is it translated a God? You know? We do have an indefinite Right, in the, yeah, in the English, right, 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 right. But there would be no need to translate that in the English because it's not there in the Greek. It's not even supposed to be there. Very good point. I didn't know that. Thank you, Father. So, we see in light of the Greek grammatics grammar, uh, we can respond to this argument. And finally, there are actually examples in Scripture where the definite article, the, is actually ref used in reference to Jesus being God. In John chapter 20, verses 28 through 29, remember Doubting Thomas? Says to Jesus, what? My Lord and my God? The original Greek translation is, the Lord of me and the God of me. Definite article used both in reference to kurios and theos, which kurios is Greek for Lord, theos is Greek for God. Jesus there in John 20, 20 referred to as the God. Titus 2, 13, Hebrews 1, 8, in all of these passages, the definite article is used in reference to Jesus being God. Slam dunk, coffin closed. Amen? All right. Now, the second clue that suggests the divinity of Jesus is the fact that he's described by John to be the creator. 
Uh, John writes, without him was not anything made that was made in verse 2. So that tells us that everything in the category of being made, right? The word's outside of that category, okay? The word made that category. So everything that's made in the category of creation, the word's outside of that category. So the word's not created. He's uncreated. He is the creator. So in light of that, we can suggest that John understands the word, Jesus, to be God. The next issue that flowers out of John's prologue is the new creation theme. Once again, remember, what did Matthew call to mind? The new creation. John does the same thing. He writes, in the beginning, that's our first clue. What would that call to mind? Obviously, the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Our second clue is the imagery of light and darkness. Right? Light shining in the darkness and the opposition between the two, which would call to mind the creation story as well, because God created the light, called it day, created the darkness, called it night, etc. And then clue number three would be the theme of life. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, John writes how, um, let's see, uh, I thought I had the quote here, but I'm, it's slipping my mind. Oh yeah, the life was the light of men. So you have the theme of life. Well, what would that call to mind? The breath of life that God breathes into Adam in the creation story. So we have a new creation theme here in John's prologue, which makes sense. I don't know if you remember, if you came to the Catholic style of Bible study seminar, I don't have time to go into this in the detail, but one of the themes of the wedding feast of Cana, which happens in John 2, is a new creation theme. John's asserting in the wedding feast of Cana that Jesus, the new Adam, ushering in a new creation with a new Eve, Mary. And we get a hint of that in light of the new creation theme in the prologue. And so the whole narrative of John is all about a new creation that Jesus is ushering in with Mary, the new Eve. The third concept that we see here in John's prologue is sal the salvation story in miniature. Something I found very interesting, I'll share it with you, uh, that I learned in my graduate studies is that there are certain clues here in the prologue that seem to suggest and make a connection to certain events in salvation history as if John is telling the story of salvation in miniature. Okay. Now some of the clues aren't, you might see, aren't like black, like explicitly there. You know, it might be a little vagueness here or there. Maybe try to, we're pulling it out of the pocket a little bit. But see what you think. Uh, the first clue is the word existing before creation in verses 1 through 2. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God before everything, anything was made. So he's not only starting with creation, he's going before creation to the existence of the inner Trinitarian life. You see? And then in verse 3 through 4, he talks about the act of creation. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made, and him was life. As if God, ex nihilo, out of nothing, creating the universe. Cl uh, in verse 5, we have a clue suggesting possibly the fall. And the proto-evangelium, the first good news. We read, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness shall not overcome it. Notice the conflict between darkness and light. Notice light shining in the midst of darkness, and the conflict between the darkness and light. Possibly, this is referring to the fall. When darkness was brought into the world, a pure, pristine world. And in the midst of that darkness and a fall in humanity, God gives us a glimmer of light of the plan of salvation about the male child crushing the head of the serpent. Notice the conflict. Amen? Another, uh, verse 9, I'm going to kind of run through these here. In verse 9, possibly we have God's revelation of himself, both through creation and supernaturally to the people of Israel. The true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. As if God giving glimmers of his light and revelation of himself all throughout salvation history. In verse uh, 10 and 11, we have uh, clues that might suggest the rejection of God by both humanity in the Tower of Babel incident and Israel. In verse 10, the world knew him not. 
Notice the world knew him not, as if all of humanity, suggesting the wickedness of humanity at the time of the Tower of Babel, rejecting God, right? And the covenantal promises with creation. In verse 11, we read, He came to his own home, and his own people received him not. Referring to Israel, Israel's infidelity to God all throughout salvation history. When they keep rejecting, constantly rejecting God, God reveals himself to them, enters into a covenant with them, they're faithful for a little while, then they're unfaithful. You see that? And then in verse 12, uh, we have this, the faithful remnant that would become the church. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So implying a faithful remnant of Israel, who would eventually be born of God in the new covenant through baptism, which we know as the rebirth, thus constituting the church. Possibly so. And then in verse 14, you have obviously the incarnation when the Word of God is made flesh. Amen? You see the movement there? I think that the clues are pretty convincing. Uh, suggests this sort of um, masterful art artistry of John weaving in the salvation story dropping hints and clues to call to mind. That Jesus, so the point is that Jesus is the culmination, right? He's the culmination of the story of salvation. Finally, the last concept that flowers out of the prologue of John is that Jesus is the new temple. Recall a while ago how I spoke about in the prophetical tradition there was prophecies of the new temple, how God's glory would return, and then the new temple, etc. Well, what we see here revealed is Jesus being the new temple, the new dwelling place. And the, and the key is the Greek word that's used for dwell. It can literally be translated as the Word was made flesh and tabernacled among us or pitched his tent among us. Now for any good Jew, what would they call to mind? Exodus. The Exodus story, right? When God instructed Moses to pitch the dwelling place of God, the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, what is what it was called? Now, we know this in light of the Greek word that's used here for dwell, the Greek word is eskenosin, which is of the same root that is, is of the same root of the Greek word used for the tabernacle or the tent of meeting in the Greek version of the Old Testament. Okay, whenever the tabernacle is referred to, the Greek word that's used there is of the same root as this Greek word that John is using in reference to the word being made flesh and dwelling among us. So Jesus, John is trying to show us that Jesus is the new temple, right? And we can even further the argument by looking at the context of John's gospel. Because recall in John chapter 2, we're in John 1 here, right? Well, in John chapter 2, verse 21, what do we find? That Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Took us 46 years to reconstruct this temple. How are you going to say you're going to raise it up in three days? John tells us he was not speaking of the physical temple. He was speaking of his body. So you have the new temple theme in John 2. And we have hints of the new temple theme in the prologue in John 1. John's trying to emphasize Jesus as the new temple. And third, we can further the argument in light of the idea of the glory of the Lord. John specifically says, and we beheld his glory. That image of glory would call to mind the Shekinah glory, as it's often referred to, the glory of the Lord that hovered over the tent of meeting of old and Solomon's temple, pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. And in the prophetical tradition, remember, the hope of Israel was that the glory of the Lord would return in the messianic day, and God would dwell in their midst once again. So, the Old Testament tradition, the glory cloud over the tent of meeting, and then the prophecies that the glory of the Lord would return in the messianic age according to Isaiah 4, 5, and 2 Maccabees chapter 2, verse 7 through 8, which Jeremiah the prophet, that records how Jeremiah before the Babylonian uh, captivity and, and attack. Jeremiah hides the Ark of the Covenant, right? People are trying to find it and he says, don't bother. The Ark will not be revealed until the glory of the Lord returns. And so he prophesies how the glory of God will return and then we'll find the Ark. Have we found the Ark yet? Say yes. Yes, we have. And who's that Ark? Mary. Mary. Amen. And John... John tells us that in Revelation chapter 5. He describes a woman, right? He says, I saw the ark, 
And then instead of describing the ark, he starts describing this woman who gives birth to the messianic king. Who is that woman? Mary. Now why does he describe the woman and not the ark? Because the woman is the ark. And notice she's clothed with the sun. Did you know in the Jewish tradition, bright light, the theme of light, the glory of the sun, calls to mind the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah glory. Okay? And so John's describing Mary as being surrounded by the glory of the Lord. And so therefore we have the newfound ark. And then further in the Annunciation mystery, what does the angel Gabriel say? The power of the Most High shall what? Overshadow you? Episkiaze. Same Greek word used in the Greek version of Exodus 40 in reference to the glory cloud hovering over the tent of meeting when the ark is put in. And so Mary's the new ark. That's what Jeremiah is prophesying about in 2 Maccabees chapter 2, verses 7 through 8. So, when John says we beheld his glory, Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecies of old, and he is, in fact, the new temple. So there we have it, folks. A run-through of these three Christmas gospel readings. So hopefully, hopefully you learned a, a thing or three. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed it as much as I did. I tell you what, I, man, I had so much fun preparing this stuff. You have no idea. And I have so much fun presenting it. It's just so much biblical riches and truths to draw out of these texts. And, and by golly, I mean, sh f sh Father can attest to and affirm this. We're only scratching the surface here, man. I mean, there's tons of more stuff that we could go into. So uh, let's close with a brief prayer. And then if you have a question or something, I can answer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We'll pray Hail Mary, uh, thanking our blessed mother for guiding us here today safely asking her to wrap us in her mantle of love so that we can be led home safely as well to our families and that the blessed mother would take us by the hand and lead us to her son Jesus who gives us access to the Trinitarian life of the blessed Trinity. Hail Mary full of grace the Lord is with thee blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb Jesus. Holy Mary mother of God Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Daughter of the Father, pray for us. Spouse of the Spirit, pray for us. Mother of the Son, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>